Jesus. Good e- I didn't hear the beep. Keep. All right. I'm used to that beep. Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to uh, look at verse 17 here this evening, uh, where John teaches us that the people belonging to the cosmic system of Satan, the world, are passing away along with their lust. So this, is, uh, uh, this section is a great section, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Uh, it's a, a very, very important subject. What the, John's teaching in these verses is extremely important. And many Christians today don't realize how great the influence of the cosmic system of Satan, the world system, uh, is in our lives. And, uh, and if you don't understand that, you're going to be deceived by it. And you're going to be making decisions that are contrary to God's word because of the influence of this great world system that Satan has. So we're going to continue that, this, uh, this study, very important study. And as is our custom, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Remember, uh, we're not going to uh, uh, understand spiritually what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in the Word of God if we're out of fellowship. So therefore, we need to confess our sins as 1 John 1, 9 teaches us. And when we do that, we're restored to fellowship based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. And we maintain that fellowship by obeying what he, the Spirit is saying to us in the teaching of the Word of God. So that's when we're filled with the Spirit, commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18, and letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls, Colossians 3.16. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, of course, I, I was just dealing with my cable company who was... Uh, uh, driving me crazy with the stupid things that they do. So that is, could be a distraction. I don't want to get that to get me uh, distracted. So and we need to cast all our anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Big deal about the cable thing, right? You get bigger problems than that. So uh, anyways, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this beautiful day here in Iowa, beautiful weather and this beautiful summer. We thank you, Father, for your logistical grace. Thank you for all the logistical grace blessings that you've given to us, the food, shelter, clothing, and all the luxuries that we have, the non-essentials and uh, the homes that we live in with the, the central air and the air, uh, heat. And uh, we thank you for our cars and our, our uh, jobs and our schools. And we just thank you, Father, for... Uh, this church here in Iowa. Thank you for all those who are part of this ministry, uh, whether it's here in Iowa or part of our extended congregation through the website on the internet. Uh, We just thank you for each and every person. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us uh, four days a week. We thank you for their sacrifices that they make and their family. And we also uh, thank you, Father, for this study in 1 John. And we just thank you for the things that we're learning, and we pray that you would help us in our study of 1 John 2, 15 through 17 here this evening. Help me as the communicator to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. We pray that the Spirit would use me mightily as his instrument to communicate accurately your word, to accurately interpret and communicate your full counsel to your people that is found in your word. We pray that you would help your people by the Spirit to understand the word of God, to understand this passage, and to take it to heart and to apply it things that they're learning, apply it in their lives so that they might not fall victim to the deception of Satan's cosmic system, which is, as of course you know, so powerful. And we pray, Father, that your people would take this message seriously. And we also pray, Father, that uh, as a result of applying what they're being taught, that they would bring glory to you and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we also pray that you would help Titus with the sound and the recordings, of the video, the audio, and help him to... Help him to go and uh, uh, take the, uh, record these classes and put them up on the internet. We thank you for his service, the technology, and the people taking advantage of the technology as well. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you should be at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. You should have my translation uh, open to that verse as well. Uh, and uh, we're going to um, 
be reading it from the Net Bible in a few moments and also from the ESV, these verses, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And as I mentioned before, the opening prayer we're going to be uh, teaching uh, tonight in verse 17 with regards to uh, John's, uh, what John says in this verse, this verse he says that the people belonging to the world system of Satan are passing away along with their lust. Of course, there's much more to that verse uh, where he says that whoever does the will of God abides forever. And that actually means... Uh, uh, it's, it doesn't, uh, what actually it means there is uh, you're living with reference to that which is eternal. And so uh, when, they do, when you do God's will, so that's what that second half of the verse means. We'll see that tomorrow evening. So this is a very important subject, the cosmic system of Satan. You've heard me mention this before in the past many times. The church has three great enemies. Of course, we, have, we know about the devil, but we also know about uh, the sin nature as well. In our genetic structure of our physical bodies, Paul calls our bodies a body of sin, and that means that the sin nature resides in the genetic structure of our physical body, and it tempts us to sin. It wages war against the soul. Paul mentions that in Romans 7, and Peter does as well in his first epistle. And so this uh, sin nature is the enemy within. Of course, that sin nature we got as a result of the Adam and Eve, they were judged by God, and the consequences for their disobeying the Lord's command to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was that they'd not only be a curse upon uh, their environment, the earth, but also upon their bodies. Uh, the, uh, the, the physical body is corrupted by this sin nature. And this is why we get old and die, and that's why we need a resurrection body as well. And so that's the second enemy we have. Associated with the first enemy, Satan, is the cosmic system, because it, it actually... It conforms to his ideals. It's his creation. Uh, everything that you see in this world, all the different institutions that we see in this world, as we'll see in a moment, uh, everything with regards to every arrangement of all of the arrangement of human affairs is infected by Satan's cosmic system, not to mention sin, because all of uh, every person on the earth is a sinner by nature and practice. All of the godless, all the governments of the earth are under the sway of this uh, Satan's dominion and this system. And also all the conflicts, riches, pleasures, culture, education, the world's religions, the cults and the occult are all related to Satan's world system. And it's designed to seduce people away from worshiping God, to live independently of God, just like Satan does. So um, you've heard me say this in the past. Uh, not all, uh, all evil, uh, all sin is evil, but not all, uh, not all um, evil is sin. Let me repeat that. All sin is evil, but not all evil is sin. Uh, you could do things that are not actually sin, but they're actually evil in the sense that you're living, doing those things independently of Jesus Christ. So what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, we, we don't think of Satan as this guy who turn, you know, people turn their head like the uh, exorcist and the, uh, you know, the occult and, and uh, Satanism, you know, where it's obvious these people are, are for the devil and living for the devil and his will. But Satan is much, much more wiser than that. He's the wisest creature ever to come from the hand of God. He was the anointed cherub. He was at the throne room of God. He was designed to create it to represent the holiness of God. And of course, he failed in that. And so he's very intelligent, and he doesn't, and he's not stupid. He, he's much smarter than Christians give him credit for, and he uses this world system, and he uses it to seduce people away from worshiping Jesus Christ, to distract them from seeing their need for the Savior if they're a non-believer, and distracting believers away from uh, doing God's will. Let me give you a classic example of that, of this. I, sports. Okay? I come from my background, Massachusetts, when I was growing up, played sports. Okay? Sports, we played ball games in the weekday, we played ball games in the weekend, and we played summer ball, and sports, sports, sports is just totally consume the culture. There are people I know, Christians I know, that will, will make sure their kid gets to the ball games, their ball games during the week, but it never crosses their mind that isn't it, now is it, it gets in the way of their church and going to church and learning the word of God and serving in the church, this, going to, play, playing these sports. I'm all for sports and people, kids get in athlete, having athletics, but it's gone overboard, especially in the last 60 to 70 years. Look 100, 150 years ago. Sports was not what it is today. 
because of the advent of professional sports, television, big money, it's become a big thing. And the ball games, quote unquote, the kids go to, many of these things they don't need really to go to. They need to be at church more than they need to be at the ball games. That's a fact. And if you want to debate me with that or argue with me on that, I'll take you on because you got no scripture. You're putting the ball games ahead of your relationship with God. Your, prom, your responsibility as a Christian parent is to raise your kids up in the ways of the Lord. You're to train them that they need to go to church and they need to learn their Bibles and they need to serve in the church and the body of Christ and not just have their own private sanctified Bible study. You're not independently of the body of Christ. You're, in, you're dependent upon the each member of the body of Christ and the Lord himself who's the head of the body. So there's a lot of Christians walking around today and I've had my battles with them over, you know, over the years and they just don't get it. They just don't get it. They do, so they, they'll, 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 they certainly will make all kinds of bad, you know, when there's bad weather, they'll press on through the bad weather to get their kids to the ball game. But when it comes to Bible class, no, they don't press on. They don't put the effort, not even half the effort, of getting to Bible class and seeing the need for it and teaching their kids these ways, uh, the ways of the Lord. So these parents have been deceived. The world system, here we have sports, ball games, okay? Nothing wrong with them. They're a great thing. I loved them too as a kid. I played a lot of ball. Played some of all. Played high school ball. Played all these things. But what come, it come, you have to draw a line somewhere. You have to make, you have to tell, tell you, teach your family, and you have to know it yourself as a parent that this is going over the, across the line. When sports, when the kids' ball games becomes a god and becomes an idol and takes away from serving the church that you've been called to. That's, we got a problem, major problem in America. But I say again, we didn't have this problem 150, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, because sports is not what it is today. Big institution, pro sports, pro college athletics. It's a huge, big, money-making venture, and people are immersed in it. And look at this fantasy sports thing. And all at the, at the expense of worship, and, of, and all, if you're a believer in these things and you're neglecting your relationship with God, you have fallen victim for, the Satan, for Satan's world system. You've fallen victim to this counterfeit world system that seeks to seduce people away from Jesus, worshiping Jesus Christ and learning their Bibles. So that's, this is how subtle it is. We don't, a lot of Christians, we would, you would never think, when we talk about evil, you'd never hear this talk, talked about in churches today. That, I mean, I'm sure it's taught. I know it is. Some people talk, pastors talking about this, but many churches don't even go near that area because it's so, because it's so, this, like the sports thing, it, in entertainment, so entrenched in our culture, you make enemies fast when you tell Christians, no. You'd go, the, the ball games have gone or, or, or out, of line, out, of, out of hand. The entertainment is out of hand. Everything's out of hand. You're putting these things, these things are taking away uh, from your relationship with God. So we have a very important subject here that we all need to pay attention to. So look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. As I said before, I'm going to read from the Net Bible to start off. And then the ESV. It says in 1 John 2, 15, in the Net Bible, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes, and the arrogance produced by material possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away with all its desires, but the person who does the will of God remains forever. Uh, if I could look at the ESV. The ESV those verses in the ESV are found in my, my notes. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And lastly, let's look at my translation of those exact same verses. Each of you continue making it your habit of not loving the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone does at any time love this world, then the love for the Father is unequivocally not existing in him. Secondly, each and every one of you, these things in the world, the flesh is lust, resulting in a person's lust, resulting in the arrogance produced by material possessions, are unequivocally not originating from the Father. On the contrary, they are originating from this world. 
Furthermore, this world is passing away along with its lust. However, the one who at any time does God's will is living with reference to that which is eternal. We'll look at that second half, the adversative clause, tomorrow. So verse 15, we're told not to love the world or the things in the world. And so the world system is, is what he's talking about. He's not talking about the people of the world. He's talking about the world system that we have. This word cosmos is used in the New Testament for this world system or the, the, the arrangement of people on the earth in various tribes and languages and tongues and uh, nations. And it's, uh, it's used that way as well, this word cosmos. And it's also used for the, 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 uh, the, the physical universe as well. So the world, when it says in, the, in verse 17, in the ESV, and the world is passing away along with its desires, that's presenting another reason. Why the recipients of this epistle were to obey the two prohibitions John issues them in 1 John 2.15, which are in addition to the previous two presented in verses 15 and 16. Now, as reflected in my translation and, and substantiated by John's teaching in 1 John 2.12-14, uh, uh, the recipients of this epistle were already obeying this pro these prohibitions to not love the world system, and not to love the things from this world system. So they are already obeying these things, because 1 John 2, 14 through 15, uh, 12 through 14 says that they were already, he was con uh, confirming that they were obeying his gospel and, not had, and had not fallen victim to the false teachers. And so these Christians were the, uh, in the Roman province of Asia in the last decade of the first century AD. They were born again believers. So they were faithful. So the, command, the prohibition here is more like, as I've reflected my translation, continue to make it your habit of not loving the world or the things of the world. So this, uh, that pro those two prohibitions are obviously interconnected to each other. And the, the, first, the fifth class conditional statement that follows it uh, is actually given the first reason why they should obey this prohibition. In my translation of verse 15, at the very end of that verse, I use, it says, if anyone does at any time love this world, then the love of the Father is unequivocally not existing in him. Uh, the, uh, the Net Bible, they translate that phrase, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's the first reason why they should obey the prohibitions. And then the, 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 what we see is the next pro, uh, reason is found in verse 16. Because all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the arrogance produced by material possessions is not from the Father. So that's the second reason why they should obey the prohibitions. It's from the world, these, these, these things. And then now we have the third reason why they should obey the prohibitions in verse 15. It's found in verse 17. So there's the, the, the third reason why they should obey the prohibitions in verse 15. Found here in verse 17 is the third reason. Now, what does he mean? The world is passing away. And he says, well, the world, in the ESV, he says, the world is passing away along with its desires, the, uh, the net Bible. Uh, they, they render those, uh, that phrase, uh, that first statement, and the world is passing away with all its desires. So they're all pretty much the same. And so what does that mean, though? Uh, the word for world, again, reiterate, reiterate what we've been talking about with this word world. It's the word cosmos in the Greek, for those who are interested. It's translated correctly, but it's referring to not the people of the world or creation. It's referring to a vast system, an arrangement of human affairs, earthly goods, godless governments, conflicts, riches, pleasures, culture, education, world religions, the cults and the occult, dominated and negatively affected by Satan, who is the god of the satanic cosmos. Uh, that's uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Paul says, Satan is the god of this world. That's temporarily, of course. And what does he mean by that? He's been given rulership over the earth temporarily. Of course, when Christ comes back at his second advent to establish his, his millennial reign, that reign of Satan over the earth is stopped for a thousand years. And then he's released uh, for a time, and he he's then starts another rebellion on the earth among the human race, and that's put down, and he's finally... Uh, his sentence has been, will be executed. The sentence to go to the lake of fire will finally be executed uh, in, uh, after, the great white throne, uh, after the great white throne judgment. And so uh, this is very important. Satan is the god of this world. Of course, this world that we live in, every area of our society, or the whole entire fabric of our culture, this culture, the cultures around the world, the governments around the world, education around the world, entertainment, you name it, it's all affected by Satan. 
It reflects his standards. When you and I are in the millennial reign, you will not, this, this, will, this will, is totally, it will be totally unrecognizable from the, in the sense that it will not look anything like what we see today. You look at things today in our world, the injustice, the crime, the child abuse, uh, the, the, you name it, the anti-authority attitude that's in our culture and all cultures of the world, this rejection of Jesus Christ, rejection of the Bible, antagonism toward the Bible and Jesus Christ, antagonism to anything Christian, that's all from the devil's world. You are living, as I said many times, in enemy territory. And you can stick your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist, but you just fall, by doing that, you just fall in victim to the lies of Satan's cosmic system. And most Christians do. It's, too, it's much easier to get along and be liked by the world than to say the world's wrong. And to live your life contrary to what everybody else's standards are. God, our God, God's standards are totally antithetical to Satan's standards. And that tells you everything. And that's what we're, we're totally immersed in this culture that's infected negatively by Satan. So this word, cosmos, world, it's not only referring to a system, but also an organization in the sense that it refers to the formation into a whole of interdependent and coordinated parts for harmonious and united action against God. It refers to the assemblage also of fallen angels forming a complex whole that is under the authority of Satan. Paul mentions this, this authority structure in Satan's, uh, Satan's government and Ephesians 6.12. The church's enemy is Satan and he uses the angels, the fallen angels and Satan use this world system and they use it to, to attack the church and to attack the Bible and Christianity. Put a lot of pressure on the believer in Jesus Christ Put a lot of pressure on them. Persecute them. Kill them if you must. But in our day, in our, which is interesting, Satan doesn't do that in our country right now to Christians in, in, in America, uh, but he does that in many other parts of the world, and that's what he's done throughout history to the church, throughout the world. Okay, But if we live in America, and we are so wealthy that he just uses that to seduce Christians away. Materialism. Stuff. Homes, cars, entertainment, sports, computers, cell phones, you name it. He can use anything he can to do. He knows you and I like a book. He, they've, they've been watching us for centuries. They know you and I better than we know ourselves. And they know our weaknesses. They know your family's weaknesses. They know, let's say, they know your, uh, where you, your biological parents, your pa adopted parents. He knows if you're, if you're adopted, he knows all about your sin nature trends are. He knows all about that, and they know how to play to that. They are so smart. They ex they've been watching us for years, centuries, centuries. And they know how to appeal to our sin nature trends. They know what, get, what, what will move us to go away from God. So you've got to be aware of that. So this word, cosmos, world, it contains the figure of metonymy, meaning that the cosmic system of Satan is put for those sinners who are its citizens. Thus the word speaks of those sinners, enslaved to sin and Satan, passing away from the earth, along with their lust for material possessions. Now, when it says passing away, as was the case in 1 John 2, 8, where the word of first appeared, here the verb parago is uh, in verse 2, 7, 1 John 2, 17, means to pass away, since the word pertains to something going out of existence. Now the word is used without a direct object. It refers to Satan's kingdom and his world system, which is totally opposed to Christ's kingdom, as passing away or passing out of existence. And I'm going to tell you how that's happening. It's actually on its way out. Specifically, this word parago, it speaks of passing away. It speaks of those people who are enslaved to sin and Satan, passing away from the earth, along with their lusts for material possessions. Now, in, here in verse 17, the words in the present tense, this verb parago, it's a customary present or a state of present, we call it in Greek grammar, and that's used to signal an ongoing state indicating the people belonging to Satan's kingdom exist in the state of passing out of existence from the earth. The sons of disobedience in Ephesians 2 and at Colossians chapter, uh, we was it Colossians chapter, 
we looked somewhere in the Colossians, I can't remember where, but say, uh, the sons of disobedience is a term in, that Paul uses, an expression, for the unbelievers, those who are not saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. They're passing out of existence. And unless they, unless they trust in Jesus Christ, they're, gonna, they're not going to stay on this earth much longer. They might last 70, 80 years, 100 years, you know, the, the lifespan of man. And, uh, but they're not going to inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Those who trust in Jesus Christ shall inherit the earth. Not them. Not Satan. This planet is God's and he's Christ and ours, those who are members of the body of Christ. So the present tense of this verb is also a, a gnomic present, we call it, used to make a statement of a general timeless fact. Therefore, it expresses the historical uh, fact that the people belonging to Satan's kingdom and their lusts exist in a state of passing out of existence from the earth. And the words, the verbs in the passive voice, that means the subject receives the action from an either unexpressed or expressed agency. Now the subject here is the kingdom of darkness and it's lust. The agency is implied. This is very important. What I'm telling you is that this word passing away, parago, it's in the passive voice. This is very important because it has to do with us and Christ. Okay? The passive voice says that the subject, which is the kingdom of darkness in this context, the, the world system of Satan, is receiving an action from an expressed or unexpressed agency. Now the agency here is, the, is uh, actually implied from the relative pronoun clause in 1 John 2.8, which affirms that the command to love one another exists in the state of being true in the life of Jesus Christ and the lives of the recipients of this epistle who are members of his body, the church. So what that means is that the passive voice is expressing the idea that these people, that John says in 1 John 2.17, who belong to Satan's kingdom and, the, and its lusts, are being made to pass out of existence from the earth because the command to love one another was true in the life of Jesus and in the lives of the members of his church. So in other words, we're taking over from them. This planet is ours by right because we obeyed the, Jesus obeyed the command to, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself and we've obeyed the command that he gave to us to love one another. Or the recipients of the epistle uh, had done this. We should be doing it too. This is very important. So we're the ones, we're the agency, the implied agents, or we could say, take us out of the picture in the context of the epistle. The recipients of this epistle, these Christians who received this epistle, who are faithful to John's apostolic teaching, along with Jesus Christ, their head and our head, are the agency which is making this, the, the world and its lust, the people of this world and its lust, to pass away from existence from the earth. Now, when it says, along with its desires, it, uh, it says in, the, uh, in the, um, the, the Net Bible, but in the world is passing away with all its desires, and uh, the ESV has the same expression, along with its desires, very similar. So the word for, uh, the word for translated along, it's the conjunction chi for those who are interested, and this word, it means along with, uh, translated correctly, and the reason why is because it's a marker of accompaniment. What does that mean? It indicates that the lusts for material objects in the cosmic system will pass away along with the people belonging to the cosmic system itself. So this phrase, along with its desires, is saying, not just this world system is passing away, but, and the people that belong to it, but all of their desires, their ungodly sinful desires, are passing away as well. The word for desires, epithumia, we see it in Paul's writing this word, it refers to any type of lust which is related to either an animate or inanimate object in the world which produces an arrogance in a person as a result of possessing these objects. Thus the word desires there speaks of the lust for material possessions. I like the translation for this word as being lust because that's what he's talking about here. Now the uh, articular construction of this word is employed with the, the intensive personal pronoun autos in order to denote possession and that simply means it's indicating that these lusts are the possession of the cosmic system of Satan or the people deceived and enslaved to the cosmic system. Now, if you could, please look at my translation of 1 John 2.15. We're going to read verses 15 and 17 from my translation again. And let's, uh, now that we've gone through the text 
the original text and brought out some things that not found in your translation. And then we're going to talk about, uh, present more of the exposition of verse 17, what John's saying with this first reason here in verse 17 for obeying the prohibitions in verse 15. So it says in 1 John 2, 15, each one of you continue to make it your habit of not loving the world nor the things in the world. If anyone does at any time love this world, then the love for the Father is unequivocally not existing in him. You can't love the Father, say you love the Father and love this world system. And Jesus said something similar with regards to money. You can't love both money and God. Either you will you'll despise the other or, or, or be devoted to the, the other. One of the, you'll be devoted to one or the other or despise one or the other. See, that tells you that it's an absolute. That's what John's talking about. John speaks in absolutes. I think in our culture today, because we don't believe in absolutes, even people in the church don't speak in ap absolutes because they've been infected by the world system where you, really, you don't think there's any absolute. There is absolute. There is right and there is wrong in this world. The world would say, no, you can't. There's gray areas. Yeah, there, you know, gray areas, depending, we, 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 gray areas, sin is sin. The Bible's pretty clear about that. It tells you what sin is. There's no gray areas there. Okay, it tells you, comes right out and tells you what God's will is and what is sin. Okay, so he says in verse 16, secondly, each and every one of these things in the world, the flesh is lust, resulting in a person's lust, resulting in the arrogance produced by material possessions, are unequivocally not originating from the Father. On the contrary, they're originating from this world. Furthermore, this world is passing away along with its lust. And that's what we'll be looking at for the rest of the evening. How, and we've looked at so far. And then he says, how, and this we'll look at tomorrow, however, the one who at any time does God's will is living with reference to that which is eternal. That'll be a good class tomorrow. Now, verse 17, as I said earlier, presents the third and final reason why the recipients of this epistle must continue to make it their habit of obeying the two prohibitions which John issued them in verse 15. The first required that they not love the world, which is a reference to the cosmic system of Satan, the first prohibition. The second required that they not love the things of this system. This is a reference to the various inanimate and inanimate objects which the devil and his angels employ to appeal to the indwelling Adamic sin nature of people so as to get them to commit idolatry rather than worship God. In fact, when John ends this epistle, 1 John, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Look at it, people. Anything could be an idol. Even a real human being could be an idol. You know, you could, put, you could love your husband more than Jesus. That's an idol. You could love your wife more than Jesus. That's an idol. You could love, you could love, a, 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 you could love a, another person's body, lust after, after that body to the point where... It, God's out of the picture. You don't, you don't love God. You love that body, or that person that you're lusting after more than you, or you love legitimately because then your, your spouse married. You love them more than God. You love the children. The people, who you, you, could be, you could love children more than God. That's idolatry. Anything you put, your, put ahead of your relationship with God is sin. It's idolatry. Idolatry is not simply worshiping a little figurine. You know, you, you know, having a, 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 you know, a statue of Mary in, your, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, in a little uh, pool outside your house. Or, you know, it's not, that's, you know, or, you know, people like used to, uh, you know, worship, people worship cows or they worship the tree like the American Indian, Indian or they worship some, uh, an animal like the, uh, uh, many religions of the world do, many people of earth have done throughout the centuries. That's all idolatry. Doesn't matter what it is. Money is something that, in materialism, is something that we in America, and this is true around the world today in our culture because of the influence of, of, of capitalism, American capitalism, we could take those things and they become, even though they're nothing evil in themselves, it's our attitude toward them that makes them evil. That we, that's why Paul says to stay away, in First Timothy we studied chapter 6, stay away from the love of money. Money in itself is not wrong. You need it. <laughs> you know? But it's our attitude toward it, where we say we'll do all of our decisions and our priorities will be geared to getting that money, rather than putting all our energies toward worshiping God. So we see that the the, the this, uh, this 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 prohibition not to love the things of the world. It's talking about the various animate that's living things or inanimate objects, non-living things, which the devil and his angels employ 
to appeal to the indwelling Adamic sin nature of people so as to get them to commit idolatry rather than worship. Now, let me tell you something. Let me balance this. You might, somebody, somebody might be listening to me who's got a bad attitude right now, and they might be thinking to me, you know what? You don't want us to have any fun. Well, that's funny. That's what the devil said to the woman about God, with God. He doesn't want you to have any fun. <laughs> you know? No. I'm trying to, God, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with stuff, you know, phones. There's nothing wrong with a car, nice home. Nothing wrong with having nice things. Nothing wrong with having material possessions. The problem is, don't make them more, acquiring them as the most important thing in your life where your priorities are geared for that. Yeah, God wants you to have fun, but in the boundaries that he's put. You start doing, living life outside the boundaries that God has given you, you've got, you're going to get hurt. Let's take, like, just a quick thing, sex. Marriage, was sex and marriage, was, that's where sex was supposed to be in the boundaries of marriage. Get outside that, you're going to get hurt. You're going to either get a disease, you're going to get a broken heart, or you're going to get pregnant. Okay, so I say that to people all the time, especially young people, because they don't, they don't realize. <laughs> they, don't, they, they just, they don't know. They don't know enough. They haven't been around. They don't have any experience. And maybe they, and they also don't know their Bible. But you need to pay attention to this. God wants you to have fun, but within the boundaries that he has set up. So again, in regards to this subject we're talking about, nothing wrong with a, a money. Nothing wrong with a house and other possessions. Nothing wrong with having these things. The question is, are those things more important to you than your relationship to God or not? Now, the first reason why the recipients of this epistle must continue to make it their habit of obeying these two prohibitions, which John issues them in verse 15, is presented at the end of this verse in the form of a fifth-class conditional statement, which I mentioned to you earlier. This fifth-class conditional statement teaches the if clause in verse uh, uh, 15. It teaches that if anyone does at any time love this world system of Satan, then the love for the Father is as an eternal spiritual truth unequivocally not existing in them. The second reason is found in verse 16. I pointed out that to you earlier. That asserts, that verse asserts that each and every one of these things in Satan's world system are not originating from the Father, but rather from this world system of Satan. He identifies each of these things as being the flesh's lust, a person's lust, and an arrogance produced by material possessions. You can see the progression there in my translation. The second results in the first, and the third results in the first and the second. The flesh is lust as a reference to a person's and dwelling Adamics in nature that I talked about at the beginning of class, our, in, in, our enemy that indwells us. Therefore, this indicates that the old sin nature's lust after these various animate and inanimate objects in this world system of Satan results in a person's lust after these objects, which results in a person becoming arrogant as a result of these material possessions. Thus John is speaking of a believer obeying their lust of this in nature, which results in arrogance. Now, here in verse 17, John presents the third and final reason why the recipients of this epistle should continue to make it their habit of obeying those two prohibitions in verse 15. They would obey these prohibitions because this world system is passing away along with its lust for material possessions. What John is saying is that the people enslaved to Satan and their sin nature are passing away along with their lust for material possessions. That's why you say, you look at people in the world and you say, you know, you look at people who are very wealthy and they have, and they're, well, they might be entertainers, musicians, politicians, or business people, and they got all the money in the world. They got never ever lack for money. They live in nice homes. They never seem to have a problem in life except you know, the paparazzi or something. And so they have, they, they, but you know what? And they're they're non-believers. They can't take it with them. It's good. It's gonna, they're going to leave it all behind. Probably leave it to a kid who doesn't give a, a hoot and holler about them. It happens all the time. They achieved all this success from the world apart from God. What a waste. Think about that, people. When you make your decisions in life, especially young people who are listening to my voice, start thinking about that now. You know, what are you gonna what are you gonna do live your life for? What is the most important thing in your life? If it ain't God, if it isn't Jesus Christ, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going bye bye away from him. And right down the road where you're gonna get disciplined by God. Because he loves you. He's gonna try to bring you back and he'll do whatever it takes to get you back. I don't want you to see you get in that situation or adults who are involved. Many adults are like this. They're just as bad as the kids. I can see the kids not doing the right thing, but the adults 
should know better, and yet they go right down that path. And so we have to be, these people, that, all this stuff that they accomplish, it's going away. Even music. You know, I was thinking about that. You know, I was thinking, all that music, great music I grew up with and I love and still play. That's not going to be the music, the music of the millennial kingdom or the, 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 the new heavens and the new earth. You know, they're not going to be singing the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. <laughs> they won't be singing that song, great song. But quite frankly, they'll be singing, hopefully, my songs, you know. <laughs> and some other, you know, they're, they're going to be singing these, these songs that honor God and honor Jesus Christ and, sp and, and speak back and communicate the word of God in musical form. That's what's going to be around. You know, that it's the, the, the great entertainers and musicians and songwriters of this world system, unless they, would, they wrote to honor Jesus Christ, it's all bye-bye. It's all burned up. Everything you see is going to be all... When we study the day of the Lord, the whole world is going to be burned up. Your home is going to be burned up. I don't care how nice it is or how strong you built it. It's going down. Everything's going down. Everything, Washington, that whole area, you know, beautiful, our beautiful country, gone, wiped out because of the judgments that will take place during the 70th week of Daniel. People don't want to listen to that. They don't want to hear about that because it's too disturbing because many times it's disturbing because they've been falling for the lie and it's too hard to admit they're wrong. Boy, what a stupid, stubborn way to be. Admit you're wrong and start living for God, living for Jesus Christ and not for the things of the world. Don't be deceived. Why waste your life? You know, one of the things I, you know, as a Christian, I've always said this to, you know, I've always said this to God and I've always said this to others. I want my life to mean something. When I die, I want people to say, even if my enemies, well, there's a guy who believed in Jesus Christ. There's a guy who was dedicated to him. You know, that was a guy who was faithful. That's what I, I want, you know, they, they, even my enemies to know that. That person stood for Jesus Christ in the Bible. That's what I want to be remembered by. I don't care, if, I don't want the world to love me. Because the world, who wants the love of God? I mean, who wants to be honored by godless people who don't, who don't have godly standards? I wanted to be honored by Jesus Christ and, the, and, and, and be applauded by the angels and, and, accept, and, and be praised by the Father. And that's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I wanted. That's why I've devoted my whole adult life to that. And many of you have done the same thing. Because I know what it really matters in life. To grow up, become like Christ, to do God's will. And we do that. We help others, both non-believers and believers. We have a blessing to them. Living for the things of the world is the path to destruction. We're, not, we're going to be under discipline if we do follow after the world. If we're a non-believer, it's going to end up in the lake of fire. What a waste. So think, de think deeply. Think, de think deeply and, and, and very, th think about, be serious about your life. Think about your life. What do you want to be? What do you want to do? What is going to be your priorities? Think deeply about these things. You know, think deeper than kids and homes and uh, jobs and money. Yeah, I know they're important, but think deeper than that. You know why? Here's the other thing the world does. We're so immersed by, there's so many, I mean, the phone rings, the television's on. Uh, there's a, there's a, the, all these things trying to get our attention to distract us in our modern culture. So we won't think of these things. You know, years ago, you read some of the, the people that, uh, you know, I, I read some of the people, old timers you know, in Christianity, they were deep thinkers. You know, they thought deeply about their relationship with God and they had time to do it. We have more distractions that keep us away from deep, thinking deeply about our relationship with God and about life and what does it matter, what, what really matters in life. Why we are here on the earth. You know, take the time to do that. But if you're not going to do that, that's an example of the devil's world just using all the bells and whistles to try to get you distracted so you won't think about these things, so you won't make a good decision, so you will go the other way. Wake up. Wake up and listen. Listen. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. Think deeply about what you're going to do in life. What are you doing now? What do you want to do? You're, you're, let's say you're in middle age. Well, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? What are the time you get left? If you're 70, 80 years old, what do you want to do with the, left, the few years you have left? What do you want to do? What's important to you? What does God say is important? So, 
John teaches that in contrast to those enslaved to Satan and the sin nature, the believer who at any time does the Father's will is living with reference to that which is eternal. The reference to the eternal, as we'll see tomorrow, is a reference to experiencing fellowship with God, which is in essence experiencing eternal life, which we taught in our, week, our Sunday classes, in our series on fellowship. Now in 1 John 2.8, the Apostle John presents the reason why Satan's cosmic system and reign over the earth is coming to an end. I pointed this out with the passive voice of Parago in verse 17 translated, is passing away. Look at my translation of 1 John 2.8, please. Why is this world passing away? And its desires, 1 John 2.8 gives us the reason. In our translation it says, but from a different perspective, I'm providing information and writing at this particular time for the benefit of each one of you regarding a new command. That's the command to love one another. Which is true in him, in the life of Jesus, because he did it perfectly, as well as in each of you, the recipients of this epistle, were Christians. They, that means he's affirming that they were loving one another. They were being faithful. Because the darkness is being made to pass away while the true light is already shining. To pass away is the same word we see in verse 17 used with the world and its desires, past the people of the world and the world system and its desires, passing from existence from the earth. And the reason why? Us, the body of Christ, and Christ himself, the head of the body. This verse, verse 8, as we studied in the past, reveals that the reason why the cosmic system of Satan is passing out of existence from the earth is that the command to love one another is an historical fact in the life of Jesus Christ and the lives of the members of his church who are obeying this command to love one another. So that's pretty, that's pretty important there that we see. So go back now to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse 15 again, please. And we'll close. First John 2.15. Now, what we remember we just read in First John 2.8? Listen to Warren Worsby. I was looking for this quote. That's why I was looking at my notes here. Warren Worsby has the following quote. And it's related to what he, John just said in 1 John 2.8. Listen to what he says. It, it's applicable to what our study is tonight. Warren Worsby writes, When one looks at Jesus Christ, one sees love embodied and exemplified. In commanding us to love, Jesus does not ask us to do something that he has not already done himself. The four, gospel, the four gospels record the account of, the, of a life lived in the spirit of love, and that life was lived under the conditions far from ideal. Jesus says to us, in effect, I live by this great commandment, and I can enable you to follow my example. Jesus illustrated love by the very life that he lived. He never showed hatred or malice. His righteous soul hated all sin and, the, and disobedience, but he never hated the people who committed such sins. Even in his righteous announcements of judgment, there was always an undercurrent of love. It is encouraging to think of Jesus' love for the 12 disciples, how they must have broken his heart again and again as they argued over who was the greatest or tried to keep people from seeing their master. Each of them was different from the others, and Christ's love was broad enough to include each one in a personal, understanding way. He was patient with Peter's impulsiveness, Thomas's unbelief, and even Judas's treachery. When Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another, he was only telling them to do as he had done. Consider, too, our Lord's love for all kinds of people. The publicans and the sinners were attracted by his love, and even the lowest of the low would keep his, could weep at his feet. Spiritually hungry, a spiritually hungry rabbi, Nicodemus, could meet with him privately at night, and 4,000 of the common people could listen to his teaching for three days and then receive a miraculous meal from him. He held babies in his arms. He spoke about children at play. He even comforted the women who wept as the soldiers led him out to Calvary. Perhaps the greatest thing about Jesus' love was the way it touched even the lives of his enemies. He looked with loving pity on the religious leaders who in their spiritual blindness accused him of being in league with Satan. When the mob came to arrest him, he could have called on the armies of heaven for protection, but he yielded to his enemies. And then he died for them, for his enemies. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But Jesus died not only for his friends, but also for his foes. 
As he, they crucified him, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they do not, know not what they do. In his life, in his teachings, and in his death, Jesus is the perfect example of this new commandment to love one another. And this is what helps to make the commandment new. In Christ, we have a new illustration of the old truth that God is love and that the life of, that the life of love is the life of joy and victory. What is true in Christ ought to be true in each believer. As he is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4, 17. A believer should live a life of Christian love because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. This reminds us of the emphasis of 1 John on walking in the light. Two ways of life are contrasted. Those who walk in the light and practice love and those who walk in the darkness practice hatred. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes this truth. End of the quote. End of quote. So, what are we going to do? The apost Jesus and the recipients of this epistle loved one, loved one another. They obeyed the command to love one another. They lived according to God's holy standards. That means they walked in the light. Light, the figure for God's holiness. When we love, when we love each other, love God and love each other, love our enemies, love the non-believer, love the, our fellow believer, we're walking in the light according to God's holy standards. When we're obeying God's word, that's God's standards. When we're disobeying God, that's Satan's standards. When we're living in sin, disobeying him, we're living according to the devil's standards. That's totally contradictory to who God made us to be, to save us and sanctify us, to serve him and become like his son. We're living a life of contradiction. We're living a double life. And when you're living a double life, people, it's miserable. You can fake everybody, you can fake other human beings out, but you'll never fake God out. Got to keep this in mind, people. We want to be a part, we want to be a, experience a, being a part of this victory. And we do that by loving one another. Look at 1 John 2.15, again, in my translation. Each one of you continue to make it your habit of not loving the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone does at any time love this world, then the love for the Father is unequivocally not existing in him. Secondly, each and every one of you, one of these things in the world, the flesh is lust, resulting in a person's lust, resulting in the arrogance produced by material possessions, are unequivocally not originating from the Father. On the contrary, they're originating from this world. Furthermore, this world is passing away along with its lust. However, the one who at any time does God's will is living with reference to that which is eternal. So I end with a question uh, to you all, a rhetorical question. Are you living with reference to that which is eternal? Which in other words is, are you experiencing eternal life? In other words, are you experiencing fellowship with God? If you are, that's living with life with, regard, life with regards to that which is eternal. But if you've fallen in love with the things of the world and the world system, and you're totally duped by it, then what's going to happen is, and you live for its lusts, various lusts of the sin nature, you're not living to, with reference to what is eternal, and therefore you're living a life that is a contradiction. You're playing for the enemy. You're not God. So my prayer is that if you're doing the right thing, that you keep doing the right thing, like the recipients of this epistle did, but if you're not, make changes. Stupid to sit there and, kill, make, and still make the wrong decisions, make bad choices, as if there's going to be no consequences. There is consequences. Big consequences. We have to stand before Christ, every one of us. I do, you do, every, every believer, at the Bema seat. Don't say, oh, I'm just happy to be saved. That's, that's arrogance. You want to do, grow to maturity, get all the rewards that God wanted you to get, because that demonstrates that you were faithful to him that you lived a life that was not a contradiction, you lived a life that was consistent with who God made you to be and how he saved you and sanctified you. He, he saved you to have a, a relationship and a fellowship with him and his son and the Holy Spirit. That's what the getting rewards will demonstrate, that you lived consistent and with his will and you lived in agreement with his will and you lived in, 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 uh, in agreement with his holy standards. But if we don't get rewards... That, and that's right after the rapture, this, this famous seed. We have to stand before him, and if we don't get rewards, that's just the manifestation that we didn't live our lives with reference to that which is eternal. In other words, we weren't experiencing fellowship with God. And you could pretend you're a hot Christian, you're great, and you're so wonderful, and you could put on airs for people and say all the right Christian lingo and go to church six days a week or whatever it is, and you think that you're something else just by those outward expressions, but your heart is far from God. God sees the heart. 
God sees the heart. You can fake other people out, you can't fake God out. And we won't be able to fake Christ out at the baby seat. You will not be able to do that. You can fake me out, you can fake other, other pastors out, you can fake other Christians out in the world, but you're not going to fake him out. So let's live our lives with, with reference to that which is eternal. Let's have a, continue to experience fellowship with God. And if we're not, confess our sins and ask God to help us to get our lives straight, get our priorities straight, so that we can get a full reward at the Bema Seed. Thank you, Father, for this time to study word. We thank you for each and every person that's here in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing this class or listening through the website whether, uh, or at the other areas of the internet where we find ourselves. We pray, Father, that this uh, service would be a blessing to your people and that you would challenge your people, rebuke and instruct and encourage them, instruct them in righteousness with regards to your will. And we just pray, Father, that uh, this uh, service will be a blessing as your people, to blessing to your people, and as we apply what they're learning. God, we pray the Holy Spirit would guide them in applying the things that they've been taught here this evening. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.